Okay, welcome to the first League of Women Voters Lunch and Learn on Climate Change. We hope that every, we figured everybody would need to eat. So we thought this was a good time slot. It is being recorded. So if you can't make it, um, or you know somebody wants to see it and can't make it, um, do look for it. It should be in the Monday morning news. Um, League of Women Voter members get that in on Monday morning. Um, the purpose of today's forum is to learn what is happening at the state and town levels to modify climate change. I am Janet Rothrock, and along with our moderator today, Alice Kaufman, we head the League of Women Voters Environmental Committee. <clears throat> and we're glad to see you. Um, as, as of this morning at 6.30, we had 57 signups, and so we're very glad to see you, and so many of you. But we would ask that you turn off your audio to prevent extraneous noise, because we are recording. And your video, please turn it off to conserve bandwidth. Our speakers will each speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will take questions from all of you. You can put your questions in the chat. Uh, if anybody doesn't know how to put questions in a chat, um, geez, how are you gonna say that? Because I just told you. Raise your hand. Oh, raise your hand, yes, that, that would work. Okay, um, and also if you have a particularly urgent question, please do raise your hand. Um, and I want to thank Carlin Reed, who will be monitoring the chat and sending the questions to Alice, who will uh, moderate. And also behind the scenes is Peggy Wardlin, our Zoom host and resident techie wizard. Um, our Senator well, Mike Barrett was not able to join us today uh, because he needs to appear at a Ways and Means hearing, which was scheduled after we uh, set the date for this presentation. But at this point, the bill has made it to the governor's desk. And I would like to present our first speaker, Tammy Gouveia, who is not only our climate champion, but has pressed tirelessly for transparency in the Massachusetts House of Representatives. She also recently completed her doctorate in public health and there she is labeled appropriately, yay. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, Tammy, as a public health and social work professional, uh, has been a professional for almost 20 years. Uh, she's been an effective ad advocate and catalyst for change. She spent many years working in Lawrence and Lowell on projects to address youth substance abuse and fighting the opioid, opioid crisis. She served as executive director of Tobacco Free Mass, where she advocated for statewide legislation to protect youth on tobacco from tobacco industry tactics. And once elected to the House, she has been a leader in efforts to address climate change. She has sponsored, uh, uh, sponsored legislation that has had bills passed, would have helped set a new course and had the bills passed, would have set a new course in Massachusetts to meet the climate changes ahead. Her commitment to frontline communities stemming from her early public health work and role is ingrained in her policy decisions. Uh, while no introduction will capture the breadth of Tammy's knowledge and experience, we are here today specifically to address legislative options to avert climate disaster. Thank you, Tammy. Great, wow. Well, thank you, Janet. Uh, so great to see all of you uh, here with us uh, today. It's a beautiful day. Um, I've already been out for a walk. Hopefully you can get out there uh, as well, um, just to take care of your own personal health and well-being today. Um, so I, I hadn't realized that Mike wasn't going to be here, that Senator Barrett wasn't going to be here. So I will do my best um, to give you the highlights of the landmark climate legislation. But as you know, he was really one of the primary architects and negotiators around uh, that legislation. So there may be details that I won't be able to answer quite as well as, as he could, but I will certainly do my best here. And then now that we know that this legislation is likely going to be signed by the governor, that's at least what they're signaling. Um, I have a better sense of what's happening with the net zero piece, which is legislation that I had filed last session and that I worked with Senator Barrett's office closely on to uh, get into this legislation. But I'll narrate for you uh, what our plan is for a next uh, iteration around addressing uh, buildings and their source of greenhouse gas emissions and their impact on our climate. Um, so just without any further ado, I will uh, dig right into it. Um, so the legislation, and as you've probably been tracking, um, but just in case, you're here because you're interested in climate, but really haven't been following it along super closely. Um, it's actually the fourth time that we voted on this piece of legislation, the Next Generation Climate 
legislation um, because of the back and forth with the governor um, and his office and his administration. Um, the latest iteration has some really positive um, pieces in it that I will talk a little bit about here um, because they're actually how I started off um, my career in public health was through environmental justice. So I'll spend some, some moments talking about that. But just at a high level, this bill um, does set a statewide net zero limit on greenhouse gas, gas emissions by 2050. And it also mandates emission limits every five years. So we're really going to be tracking it and making adjustments every five years. And then there's also sublimits specific to transportation buildings and other sectors of the economy. And these were some of the things that um, were also, uh, you know, where some of the opposition came from was particularly around, around buildings and the net zero building piece. Um, it also establishes a municipal opt-in uh, specialized stretch energy code. So the way I had written my original legislation and working with advocates very directly, I worked with MAPC um, as well as MCAM to draft that legislation and to file it, um, what we were really hoping to do is have the Board of Building Regulations and Standards create a net zero stretch energy code that would automatically require green communities to adopt that, that code over a certain period of time. And what this legislation actually does is slightly different is it doesn't require that if you're a green community that you have to adopt the net zero stretch energy code. It just says that the code will be developed and promulgated by actually the Department of D DOER in conjunction with the BBRS, um, but and it's a municipal opt-in. So you may live in a green community and your um, leadership, I, I don't anticipate that this will happen in our area, but it is a possibility that there is a community that's a green community that opts not to adopt the net zero stretch energy code, which means they're not going to be moving uh, forward with helping us achieve our climate goals as a state. Um, and so I have a solution to that that I'll talk about in a little bit. It also requires additional uh, 2,400 megawatts of offshore wind. Um, so it really increases the total authorization to 5,600 5, megawatts in the state. Um, it directs the Department of Public Utilities, um, which as you know, is the regulator of the state's electric and national, natural gas utilities to really have a balance in their priorities. So never before did DPU have to have any uh, focus on system safety, security, reliability, affordability, equity and reduction specifically around greenhouse gas emissions. So that is part of their charge now. Um, it also sets more uh, uh, appliance energy efficiency standards for the most common um, appliances, including uh, plumbing, faucets, computers, as well as commercial appliances. Um, it adopts several measures aimed at improving uh, gas pipeline safety. You know, we had the Merrimack Valley gas explosion. So there was a lot of attention paid to making sure that we were doing all that we could around uh, ensuring the safety of our current uh, infrastructure, our current gas infrastructure. Um, so built into this legislation is increased fines for safety violations, um, provisions really requiring training and certification of utility contractors and setting interim uh, targets for companies uh, to reduce the leak rates. And we know that this is something that obviously Mothers Out Front has really been paying attention to quite a bit across the state, but particularly in our area as it relates to the gas leaks. Um, it also requires utilities to include an explicit value for greenhouse gas reductions. Um, when it comes to the, the mass save program. And there's also some push uh, within the legislation as well, or maybe encouragement to have mass save really talk about uh, the climate benefits of um, adopting in, in someone's home, um, you know, more efficient uh, 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 appliances, changing out light bulbs, um, and just some of, you know, changing to solar panels and heat pumps and those kinds of things. Um, I just as an aside, I recently had mass save. I, I bought a new house with my partner in October. Um, we moved in and had mass save do a virtual assessment uh, just a couple weeks ago. And in our conversation, they asked, well, what's, what brings you here? Why did you want to have mass save? And I said, because I care about climate. And I asked him, I said, what do most people say? And he said, it's about saving money. And it's really important, I think, to get to help have mass save since they're at that um, they have an opportunity to talk to residents about, well, that's great, you want to save money, and here's how it also contributes to us achieving our climate goals. Um, this legislation also increases the RPS, uh, the Renewable Portfolio, 
portfolio standard by 3% um, each year from 2025 to 2029. Um, and that will over time result in a 40% uh, renewable energy by 2030. Um, so uh, apparently um, we are in the, the first in the nation um, that we will be factoring in carbon sequestration capacity of Massachusetts natural and working lands uh, directly into how we think about emissions reductions plans. Um, that's probably a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, prioritizes equitable access to the state solar programs by low income communities. Um, and it does have some specific uh, components around environmental justice, uh, defining environmental justice populations and providing new tools and protections for affected neighborhoods. And this is an area that um, Governor Baker, one of the things that he sent back to the legislature uh, actually strengthened the environmental justice components within the legislation. So that was something that, you know, we were totally willing to take up in the, in the House. Um, and I believe, you know, also obviously in the Senate as well. Um, so there's just a couple other key points of this legislation. Um, it sets benchmarks for the adoption of clean energy technologies, um, including EV, uh, so electric vehicles, uh, charging stations, solar technology, energy storage, heat pumps, and anaerobic digesters. Um, there's a $12 million fund uh, for Massachusetts Clean Energy Center to create a pathway to clean energy industry for environmental justice populations, minority owned and uh, women owned businesses and also fossil fuel workers. Um, and then it provides solar incentives for businesses, um, exempting, them from, exempting them from net metering cap to allow them to install solar systems on their premises uh, to help them offset their electricity use and save money. And then it also creates a first time greenhouse gas emission standard for MLPs, municipal light plants. So we know our MLP is really wonderful on this, but not all M MLPs have dedicated um, the same efforts to uh, addressing um, you know, uh, climate change. And so this piece of the legislation will require them to purchase 50% of non-emitting electricity by 2030 and 75% by 2040 and net zero by 2050. So um, I, I, are there questions in the chat because I don't wanna keep going if there are questions specific. Uh, Lana Zamaro asks, are sector specific limits still part of S9? Well, it's, it's now a change to S30 just so that if you're trying to track it, I know it gets really confusing to try to track legislation um, because the numbers change um, through every sort of pass that it goes through. So it is S30 now. Um, so sector specific sublimits still part of it. That I don't know. Let's see, you might've come, I noticed that you were in the waiting room Lana, as I was starting to present, um, so let me see what it says on the sublimit part. There are sublimits for transportation buildings and other sectors. So yes, it is still included. Does that, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, I wasn't clear from Mike, uh, Mike's presentation on the climate countdown. I thought he said that the sublimits were removed, but there is still flexible language around it. So if the sublimits, I mean, that's a pretty big piece. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the piece that I'm reading right here says that it does include the sublimits. Great, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so if there aren't questions on that, I can start to shift to what I'm working on filing. Um, it is a, um, yes, Ellen, we can talk about that for sure. Um, so, the, we were waiting to see what happened with this uh, legislation before filing um, a next step on net zero stretch energy code because this language um, is, you know, uh, we're happy that we got something in around buildings because when I first uh, started talking to both um, Senator Barrett and um, Rep Golden, who are chairs of the TUE, the Telecommunications Utility and Energy Committee, um, Mike thought there's no way we're going to be able to get anything related to buildings into climate change legislation this year. So since we were able to do that, and it's it's pretty good language, we're we're pretty satisfied with um, the success that we had. But of course, you know, there's so much more for us to do. Um, so the language that at this point I will be filing um, will 
encompass um, new commercial and residential construction and major renovations with the net zero stretch energy code. Um, we also wanna have uh, a little bit more language around um, defining highly energy efficient uh, net zero buildings. Um, and so, and really making sure that we're relying on renewable sources of energy for that. Um, there's sort of these, if you don't, this is newer for me, um, understanding building codes and how our building codes work and how we make decisions from year to year or every, like what the iteration is of how the building codes get changed. And so one of the building codes that we sort of follow is the IECC. Um, and this, we want to basically be matched to the IECC. So whenever the IECC is changing their code, we want to automatically have our code change along with that. And that's a three-year uh, national code cycle. Um, and then we really want to make sure that all of the green communities um, are part of uh, the net zero stretch energy code. So moving away from this opt in, opting in component and making sure that all green communities are moving towards adopting the net zero stretch energy code. Mm -hmm. And we put in timeline of 2025 and then the rest of the state by 2028, because we know we really need to be accelerating our pace around um, our climate action. And then also amending the BBRS. So again, the uh, Board of Building Regulations and Standards. Um, so having them change their mission also to include climate, public health, um, and equity. Um, and then there's also some additional um, language that we're working through with the House Council. We'll continue to work with our advocacy partners, MCAN and MAPC, to really see what's in this final S30 language and what else we might need to adopt. So what I filed uh, at the beginning of session uh, is just a placeholder, knowing that we would need to make some um, changes as we were tracking what was happening uh, specifically with this legislation. And then there, there were members of both um, Concord as well as Acton, um, which I represent both, as you know, um, who came to uh, both uh, Senator Eldridge and me and asked us to file legislation um, that would allow municipalities, and, and Alice was one of the folks who came to us uh, or came to me um, to figure out how can we allow municipalities that don't want to have any uh, fossil fuel hookups, um, how to make that a possibility. And so we have filed, Senator Eldridge and I filed enabling legislation so that um, it would allow municipalities to make the decision that they want all major and major buildings or major renovations or new buildings to be all electric or pre predominantly electric. Um, and so we filed that uh, legislation at the beginning of this session. There's some other similar legislation that other reps filed. To be honest, I haven't dug into the details of those other uh, bills that were filed or done a crosswalk between their legislation and, and my legislation. Um, so I see there are already questions in the chat, but yeah. I don't want to dive in and take over anybody's job if that's what you're supposed to be doing. But uh, I, I wanted to at least answer any questions on the uh, legislation that is sitting on the governor's desk waiting for his action on. Well, I'm happy to assist by looking at some of the questions in the chat, and then we can go on and um, from here and move to Kate after you take some questions. So um, Ellen Quackenbush asked earlier on, um, Governor Baker has said that all electric housing or municipal stretch energy code would stymie new growth and new development. And her question is, what do you think about that, cl that claim? I refute that claim. <laughs> I don't see any developers who are saying I'm not going to continue developing because you require net zero stretch energy code. And quite honestly, this is one of the problems that we have in general when we're looking at the total cost of a project is, you know, we don't look at, well, well, who's benefiting from the project and, and, and um, making money and who's having to pay more. So if, if, if we're saying, okay, well, we don't wanna make it more difficult for developers uh, to be able to make a profit off of building and um, creating affordable housing, then we're saying, well, then we accept the fact that we're fine with low income people continuing to have high energy costs. And I'm not okay, like from a values perspective, I'm not okay with that. Um, I had a conversation with Chair Golden and that was one of the things that he said back to me about the net zero stretch energy code before we knew where the legislation was going to land. 
And I said, I, I can't buy that argument. I can't, I can't be too worried about wealthy developers. I care about making sure that we are meeting our climate goals and reducing the cost for low income people. And that's what net zero does. It's the same kind of questions that I got from the BBRS when I went to testify before them on my net zero stretch energy code. And they said, well, this is going to burden low income people. And I said, it actually will not, they will have cost savings. And this is an investment that we all have to make. We have to expect that our real estate agents and our developer industry also have to contrib contribute to meeting our climate goals. It can't just be on the backs of individuals or certain industries. It really needs to be shared more broadly. So that's how I answer that question. I might also add the public health benefit of moving away from gas. People, you know, there are gas leaks in the home that many people don't recognize. There's always a low amount, a low level of um, gas from gas stoves, and some people use their gas stoves for heating, further making the problem, exasperating the problem for the families living in those homes. So, exactly. a transition from gas is um, certainly a health issue as well. Um, there's a question here from Jennifer Glass about. Um, Senator Eldridge's HERO Act that raises revenues to support affordable and sustainable housing. And the question was, what do you know about the bill? Are you familiar? Do you support it? Are you signing on? I, I don't know. So I have 300, uh, <laughs> quite honestly, 300 requests for co-sponsorship sitting in my, I have a folder and I'm going through all of those on Wednesday. Um, as you probably are aware in the house, we've now extended the time that we have to sign on as a co-sponsor of a piece of legislation. And so I've taken the time to focus on um, making sure that some of the other legislation, such as the net zero, that I'm really tracking what's happening and that I'm filing that. So I will take a look at it. Um, I'm sure it's something I would support, um, but I don't know the details of it. So I'll look at it. So thank you for raising it, Jennifer. Uh, there's a question about embodied energy. And um, there's a question about whether there's anything in the language of the bill that addresses embodied energy, especially for building construction and transportation. I don't know what embodied energy is, actually. I, like I think I've read the bill, and I don't remember seeing anything about embodied energy in the bill. But it's the embodied energy is the total calculation of the energy costs that include transportation um, from, say, a granite quarry somewhere in Italy to come and build your kitchen has a very, has a very high amount of embodied energy. And so that becomes part of the calculus about our, our carbon emissions and our carbon footprint. And um, it's I, a very big deal. Yeah, I don't think it, I think you're right. It does not include anything about, I would call that total cost, right? It, it doesn't include calculations like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think there, we have one more question in the chat and then I think we can move on to what's happening more locally. Um, it's a detailed question. I don't remember seeing this defined in the bill but how is major renovation defined? I don't know that it is defined in yeah. the um, net, next gen um, bill, but I do have definitions embedded in the language of the legislation that Senator Eldridge and I filed. Um, and I think we did have a definition in the original um, net zero stretch energy code uh, legislation that I filed last, last session. So there are definitions that um, are out there. And I think it's important that we get as specific about those as possible. Thank you. Um, I don't see other questions that you haven't addressed. Uh, oh, there's also one that it's not, this is not a question that is, that would relate to the bill, um, but it's a good question that I think at least we should think about in Concord. And that's the question about um, condo associations allowing individual homeowners to add solar to the condo units. And that's not, that's not addressed in the bill, um, but it's a question that we, it's a similar question to what we get from multi-unit housing for charging stations, right. um, how they can be installed. I think Kate has been working on uh, some projects in Concord to demonstrate whether it's possible to have charging stations in multi-unit housing, condo and or rental. Um, yeah. How about an introduction for Kate and we'll move on and we'll take some more questions at the end Thank of the presentation. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I'd like to point out that Peggy Brace tried some years ago to get um, condo associations to allow people to hang their laundry out 
So the issue of um, uh, you know uh, condo association regulations is is perennial, I guess. Okay, Kate Hanley. Um, so Kate is our director of sustainability for the town of Concord, where she is responsible for identifying, analyzing, and implementing strategies to meet the town's greenhouse gas reduction goal of 80% by 2050. Previously, Kate worked at Environmental Defense Fund in Boston, where she managed EDF Climate Corps, a network of professionals united in a, to advance climate solutions and the leading graduate fellowship program in energy and sustainability. Kate holds a dual degree from Clark University, an MBA and an MS in environmental science and policy, as well as a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And um, I question that I thought of while I was listening to Tammy was, um, how can we meet the 2050 state goals without uh, making changes in Concord? And I understand uh, you'll be speaking about one of our town meeting articles that specifically uh, relates to that. So thank you, Tim, uh, Kate. Thank you, Janet. Thanks for the introduction. And that is a great question. And just what I'm gonna talk about, what is climate action in Concord looking like and what do we need to do to meet our climate goals? So I am sharing some slides because I have some great visuals from our hot off the presses uh, greenhouse gas inventory update. I won't, uh, pummel you with all of the details, but I will give you the highlights as they relate to climate action in Concord. So thanks for having me. I think the last time I spoke at a League of Women Voters event, it was last March at a first Friday about the middle school and we were all in person in one room and feels like a lifetime ago. I'm glad that you've transitioned these to Zoom because it's a great, great event. So uh, climate action in Concord. So many of you will remember that in 2017, Concord set climate goals of 25% greenhouse gas reductions by 2020 and 80% by 2050. Uh, and last year in 2020, um, we launched our Sustainable Concord Climate Action and Resilience Plan, our roadmap for how we're gonna get started at least in the next five years on moving towards those goals. And so the climate action plan includes 22 priority actions in the areas of energy, built environment, mobility, preparedness, and natural resources. Um, so if you haven't checked out the climate action plan, I encourage you to do so. And I have some links at the end um, to point you in that right direction. But we kind of raised the question when we we're doing this climate action plan and since is how are we doing towards those goals of 80% of reduction and, and this 25% goal by 2020. So we recently did an update to our greenhouse gas inventory, which is basically how we account for our greenhouse gas emissions in Concord. And this is community wide. So every building, every car um, that, you know, all the energy that's used within the town of Concord. And so when we look at from 2008, which was our baseline to 2019, greenhouse gas emissions decreased by 22%. So a little shy of that 25% by 2020 goal, um, but heading in the right direction. And so a number of the reasons that those emissions reduced were, um, you know, coming from our decarbonized electricity supply. CMLP has been making efforts to purchase renewable energy and non-emitting electricity sources for Concord. And that contributes to the reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. We also saw a decrease in transportation emissions, which comes from overall more efficient vehicles on the road and more electric vehicles being driven by Concord residents. Um, and then just in general, a trend towards fuel switching in buildings. So especially in the earlier years, starting after 2008, we saw a lot of people switching from fuel oil to natural gas, particularly in new construction. Now we see fuel switching to electricity, which is what we're going to talk more about and what we want to see more of, um, but also just more efficient buildings overall as buildings are replaced and people are working on energy efficiency in their existing buildings that contributes to a reduction in emissions. So are we on track? Well, it's not so simple as a yes or no answer to our track to meet our goals. Uh, of course, with all things climate, it depends, right? So this is a graph that I pulled from our 2020 plan. 
that was released last year that really jumped out at a lot of people when the plan was done. And many people mentioned this to me that like this was really striking, right? You know, looking at our current pace of emissions reduction, and this was the current pace from 2008 to 2016. If if we reduce at that pace, which is about an average of one percent a year, that's that blue line that falls way short of our target of eighty percent reduction. So we need to speed up the pace. Was the conclusion from that from that plan? So we look at our, actually mapped on here just our 2020, 2019 emissions. Is that you see we're below that green line. So that looks good, right? Well, unfortunately, this will peak at a certain point because, like I said, CMLP is reducing the carbon intensity of our electricity supply, but without switching other fuel sources to electricity, we're only can get so far. So that orange dot is I modeled, if we use the same type of energy in the same amount as 2019 and 2030, even with 100% carbon-free electricity, we'll only reduce 33% from our 2008 baseline, much way short of our 2050 goal of 80%. So we need to take additional action to meet our goal. And decarbonizing buildings through electrification is really, really key. And the reason for that is that buildings make up over 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And when you look at the emissions from fuel in buildings, it's mostly natural gas. Um, and as our electricity supply gets cleaner, that wedge of electricity is gonna be a much, much smaller percent and those natural gas and fuel oil will continue to be, be more significant for them. And the reason that we switch to electricity is because electricity is the only fuel that we can make renewable. We can't make natural gas or fuel oil renewable. And CMLP, as I mentioned, is, is moving in that direction of making our electricity supply carbon free. So in order to get towards our goals, like I said, we need to go above and beyond what we're doing now. We need to electrify everything. We need to clean up our grid. We need, and we need to improve efficiency because even if we have carbon-free electricity, we still want to be efficient in how we're using that because it's coming from somewhere. So this leads me to a, a sneak peek of what's going to be coming to town meeting near you this year, um, a home rule petition. So the backstory to this is that last year, Concord Select Board was planning to bring to town meeting a bylaw modeled after one that Brookline passed that would prohibit the expansion of fossil fuel and new construction. So basically requiring new construction to be all electric. Concord was prepared to do this, but over the summer before Concord's town meeting happened, the attorney general ruled that that Brookline bylaw was not allowed because it was in conflict with state law. So Concord didn't move that article last year. And shortly after that, the Rocky Mountain Institute RMI a national environmental group put, pulled together what they were calling a building electrification accelerator for communities in Massachusetts to look at what can we actually legally do because we can't do what Brookline did, um, what can we do? And so Alice and I and a few others from Concord participated in that accelerator program and they recommended five strategies in Concord. We picked three that we thought would be a good fit for Concord to pursue. One was doing a non-binding resolution from the select board to the state saying, we need help with this, right? We need state level policy to change so that Concord and all the other municipalities in the Commonwealth can meet their climate goals. So we already did that. The select board approved that non-binding resolution in February and off it went to uh, our state legislators and to the governor's office and the agencies there. The second strategy we are looking at is green zoning. And so that is in the works now. We have been having conversations with the planning board about some options there. Um, and so hopefully we'll see, see more of those to come to fruition. And the third strategy is a home rule petition. And so this is what's coming to town meeting this year. Um, and the home rule petition would seek permission from the legislator, legislature to allow Concord to do what we wanted to do with the proposed bylaw last year. So a little more details. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about this because I know there'll be a lot of outreach coming out um, between now and town meeting about the, the home rule petition itself. But the purpose of it is to ask, as I said, for authority to regulate fossil fuel use and new construction in Concord. Um, this is not an unusual approach. Concord and other municipalities have used home rule petition for many other um, types of 
bylaws and topics. Um, but essentially, if, it, if it's approved, Concord would require new construction to be all electric. It would be a process through um, authorized to be enforced through the building inspections department. Applicants could appeal if they had a reason that they felt was valid to appeal. And there would be some exemptions, especially around backup generators, commercial kitchens, portable propane appliances like outdoor heaters and affordable housing. But I do want to note, and, and, and uh, Tammy did a good job of talking about affordable housing, right, that there's so many benefits. There's actually so many great examples of affordable housing developments in the state that have gone all electric because they're just so, there are cost benefits and health benefits to both the tenants um, and the community. So I wanted to plug, you know, we were talking about this home rule petition for new construction, but I also wanted to plug a program for existing construction. So for all of you who live in homes in Concord, CMLP just launching a new program that will help our existing homes transition to electric heating and cooling. So I highly recommend you check out the website, concordcleancomfort.org. Um, there are heating and cooling coaches that are available are free to help you look at quotes from contractors, decide that they're what's a good fit, make sure that there's quality assurance and that they're sizing your heat pump system properly. There's a participating contractor list to help you hone in on who you might want to get a quote from. And CMLP is offering a lot of rebates. So definitely check it out because obviously electrification of our existing homes is going to be uh, important to meeting our climate goals as well. So I will stop there and just say thank you and point you to the Concord Sustainability website. Obviously, there's a lot of other sustainability stuff going on. Um, we also have a really cool dashboard, sustainableconcord.org, where you can interact with some of the data um, that will be updated with some of the data I shared today. And you can follow on social media at Concord Climate. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kate. Um, so we have time for some questions. It is, we have about 15 minutes and you've got a pile of questions here, which if, I'm happy to jump in if you would like some help. Uh, first question is about Concord's climate goal of an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050 and why only 80%. I guess the other side of that is, can't we go for 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050? Do you want to answer that one or should I? Well, I will just say that the goal was set in creating my position. So I was not involved in creating that goal, but <laughs> any of you were, but well, you know, at the time that that goal was set, that was the state's goal. That was the Global Warming Solution Act goal. So it was aligned with what the state had passed at the time. And it's aligned with the Paris Agreement. Um, so that was where it came from. Uh, Tammy tell, is telling us that we're tying the legislation with Senator Eldridge and she filed in uh, it, the House Bill 1296 for those who want to take a look at it. And there's a question about what is green zoning? Do you want to take that, Kate? Or do you want me uh, to take that? Yeah, why don't you go ahead with that one? So green zoning is uh, using the, it's a how to incentivize where we want to go through the use of a uh, creative use of our zoning board, our zoning acts. Um, a lot of communities have done some really interesting zoning by creating a green building area where count, a, an overlay district in one community out in Northampton, I believe, um, that has created an overlay district in which any and all buildings that will be constructed in this particular land area must be all electric and fossil fuel free. So um, Concord took a step last year at town meeting and has some green zoning incentives implied in the uh, planned residential development. And that was a first step in Concord's approach to try to incentivize uh, developers who are putting in a PRD to look at all electric and fossil fuel construction. So it's taking those to the next level, learning from our neighbors, learning from our advisors at MAPC and through the building at, um, electrification uh, consortium that we were part of to see what, uh, what's happening in other parts of the country that we might be able to apply to Concord. Mm -hmm. So that's what green zoning is. Uh, there's a question about biomass burning. Um, I worry that biomass will be used to provide electricity, which does not make electricity green. Are there provisions in place to prevent the burning to make electric energy? That's a really good question, Lola. And I can answer from the Concord perspective and maybe Tammy can weigh in on the what if that's addressed in the 
RPS, or if it's changed in the RPS. In Concord, we do not use biomass. We had an opportunity to buy into a contract to uh, burn, to, to buy biomass from Springfield. And at the time, the, the uh, Municipal Life Board voted not to buy into the contract. And we have a general policy in place that we will not use biomass as a fuel supply in Concord. So Concord won't, but it doesn't mean that the state doesn't. The regional, the RPS standard, uh, renewable portfolio standard allows biomass statewide, but I don't know if the bill addresses that, that specifically or not, or if that's taken up someplace else. Tammy, are you aware? Yeah, I, I don't think it is. And I know that Senator Barrett, uh, I think he was asked this question, if it wasn't the Carbon Countdown, another event I was in. And there's the, the second question around the Springfield plant that relates to this. I, I think the bill is um, pretty uh, mum on biomass. I, I think many of us would agree that it's uh, not the way that we want to go. <laughs> um, and he did mention something about uh, the negotiations around um, the siting of the plant in Springfield. And, you know, there are now the, also the inclusion of the environmental justice um, language within the legislation as well. So I think it still is um, something to be watching and uh, for us to continue to advocate against um, biomass counting. I have to say, I, I read recently the, one of the letters that was submitted to the CSEP plan that does still contain biomass as, as part of the RPS. And the, comment there, the comments that were included in the letter were, we do not support biomass as being a renewable energy source and should not be included in the RPS. And that was uh, signed by the Sierra Club, uh, Arcadia Institute, uh, Mothers Out Front, I don't know who else, but there's a large consortium of folks. A uh, question from Carlin Reed about home rule petition address new construction and not major renovations. The language of the home rule petition in Concord says uh, for new construction in meeting with the planning department and with the building inspector for Concord, um, a new building covers for Concord what we would want it to cover without needing to single out a major renovation. So if you're building onto your house and you are planning on putting in heat, and that heat is going to use your existing boiler, that's fine. If you are building a separate unit that will not be tied into your heating system, then that part of the building is uh, required to be all electric. So if you're adding a room, re renovating your kitchen, uh, you know, whatever, other, moving walls in your home, this bylaw does not apply. I hope that answers your question, Carlin. Uh, I think a question from Paul Horowitz. Does this mean that Concord housing, that new housing in Concord will be, have to be heated by electricity? Yes. Would heat pumps be required? The heat pumps will not be required. It is agnostic on technology, although heat pumps are highly incentivized by the state and by CMLP. Other technologies would be available. It is right now looking to be the most energy efficient and most useful technology that we have. So although the, it, we are agnostic in, in saying what you have, must build the house with, heat pumps are generally the, the go-to. Uh, is there any provision for ensuring that the electricity isn't produced by fossil fuel? Uh, the answer to that is assurance is that CMLP's goal is to be 100% um, non-emitting fuel supply by 2030, and they're working aggressively to meet that goal. Uh, who, uh, Jennifer Glass is asking, who um, has or have you calculated carbon dioxide? So I can answer that. Um, Great. The greenhouse gas inventory, um, community-wide inventory is how we calculate our carbon emissions in town. And that is based on a standard that is followed by communities all over the U.S. and the world. It's called the U.S. Uh, greenhouse gas protocol has a global protocol for cities. So it's a methodology to account for community-wide emissions. It's an activity-based approach. So looking at activities that occur within your geographic boundary. So things like 
energy consumed, the miles driven and types of cars that are driving those miles um, and the type of energy that is consumed. So it's looking at, so that's why you see that most of our emissions come from buildings and transportation because that's where our energy is consumed in Concord. Um, and there's more details about that on the Concord Sustainability website. Um, I think maybe uh, there's a, there's a question from Carlin Reed regarding, does the gas industry have an obligation to offer natural gas service to customers in its service territory? The current, um, the current law says yes, that there is an equal access component so that all, uh, all citizens of the Commonwealth would have equal access to gas. There is no such um, provision for electricity. It doesn't say that all um, citizens of the Commonwealth should have equal access to electric homes or electrified homes. So that is one of the reasons that we are requesting home rule uh, legislation, because this is one of the areas that was identified by the, A so the AG that um, made the Brookline bylaw not uh, able to go forward because it, it was preempted by this one this particular piece of the the state law. It's an old law. It's been on the books for a very long time. It needs updating, and I think that's the next stage of the legislation is to update that. Um, hope that answered the question. And uh, another, I think there's we may have answered this question again about uh, will our concrete fuel not be fossil fuel free? And this is from somebody who's had a heat pump for a very long time. Hi, Sue, thank you for your comment. She loves her heat pump. Um, every time the town's electric grid gets a bit greener, my carbon footprint drops. That's a great quote, we should use that, put it on your website. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, I think we are at the end. Um, David Allen has mentioned that some of the energy that we buy um, although we buy renewable energy contracts as part of our, our supply, we also buy renewable energy credits for when we can't meet the whole market um, for supply with renewable energies. Our goal is to reduce the amount of RECs that we buy and increase the contracts for renewable fuels. And that's what the active policy of the light board is. And I think those are all of the questions we have. Uh, oh, Janet has a question. Uh, I just thought of something. Uh, Kate, the uh, Bezos Earth Fund, which has just been established, contains a chunk of money for electric buses. And I think that the plan is to start out with a few cities to electrify. Uh, uh, these are school buses. I think the plan is to uh, electrify in a few urban settings. However, since there's a chunk of money there, and we are all already a proven you know, entity here have experience. Is there any way to hook up into that and and um, and leverage our experience to get more funds or to tell them how we, what our experience has been to help them use their money more wisely? It's a great question, Janet. And for those of you who don't know, we are, Concord already has one electric school bus. We have a second one on the way, thanks to some grant funding um, and hope to have more in our electric school bus fleet. I don't know the details of where the Bezos funds are going directly, but I have heard that they have a strong focus on electric school buses, which is great because they offer so many community benefits. Um, so I will definitely take a look. I tell you, I, I pay attention to all grant and funding opportunities <laughs> available. So I, uh, I would be surprised if I missed one, but I will definitely take a look and see if there's an opportunity there. I think Tammy wants to add to that. Yeah, can I just jump in for a moment? So yeah. um, two things. I had a conversation with Brian Folds and he was asking what opportunities there are in the state. And we are heading into the budget season. And I have my meeting with the chair of Ways and Means on the House side, um, either tomorrow or next Tuesday. I can't recall which. And in that conversation, I'm going to talk about is there an opportunity or a possibility of us creating 
um, some sort of grant program line item um, within the budget just to keep the conversation going. And I just also want you all to know that um, when Susan Fry and I did the presentation to the eighth graders, this was one of the questions that the eighth graders asked was, how do we get more electric school buses? So I just want you to know right. that we're having an impact on the other generation and they're <laughs> thinking about it just as much as we are. So thank you for that. Great. Um, can I ask that we have just a couple minutes left. I have a question for Tammy. Um, in terms of process, if the governor decides not to sign the current uh, roadmap bill, what are the next steps to getting that passed? Can you outline them? Uh, yes, it will come back to the House and the Senate and we have a veto proof majority. Um, as I said at the outside of my, my remarks, they are already signaling that they will sign the legislation. Um, but the other option is that he could just let it sit for 10 days and that it automatically becomes law. So there are two ways that it can become law, either by his, you know, signing it with his own pen or just letting it happen. Or if he um, vetoes it, then it'll come back to the um, legislature for an override. And I think he knows that, that we have the override numbers. And so it's not really worth going back and forth. Um, and like I said, they've already signaled that they're, that they're going to sign it. So thank you. The, um, I think I read uh, the results of the vote. It was 59 to one in the Senate and 145 to something like 15 in the House, a very strong majority in both houses. So thank you for all of your work tirelessly on this, on the pandemic, on public health, on substance abuse, on family advocates. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I see no more. Uh, oh, wait a minute, Jan, one more little question. Uh, why is the governor willing to sign now? Has the bill been changed? I think it's um, the political pressure. I see that some of the pressure from the real estate developer community has uh, abated a bit um, with the legislature, again, continuing to move forward with retaining um, the net zero stretch energy code aspects that they were really um, you know, advocating against. And so I think it's just seeing the, the politics of it. This is a bipartisan, you know, there is bipartisan support for strong climate legislation in our state. So I think that's of a benefit to us as well. Um, so I think a lot of it is just, you know, the, the politics and um, they're paying attention to the politics over the last several months around this. So. And the question was, has the bill changed? And I, I think when the bill came back from the governor's desk, there were something like 50 amendments of which I don't know, the new bill contains a number of them. So there was some back and forth. Yeah, there were they were predominantly very good technical amendments and then the strengthening of the EJ component. So those are the areas where it changed. There weren't anything, there wasn't anything substantial that changed around the things that I think are important to all of us here. Great. All right, we are now at time. So I wanna thank everybody for coming. I wish we could have seen you all, which unfortunately I can't. Uh, on this Zoom call, but um, we know that you are here and have been participating with us and thank you for your questions and thoughts. You know, you can reach out to the league for, uh, with further questions about what's happening on our climate front. Kate is very accessible when she has time. <laughs> um, so I just wanna thank you. You're welcome to turn your, your cameras back on so we can at least see everybody and wave and say hello and thank you for coming. Uh, uh, oh, there's our town manager. Thank you. Great. So I appreciate everybody's attendance today.